today, I want to talk about a couple things, and this is for macro, um, and I want to talk about multipliers. Today we're going to start talking about the beginning of fiscal policy, and we're not there yet, but I want to talk about um, a couple multipliers and how we get there, and this will be added to fiscal policy. Now, we use a phrase called DI, uh, or which stands for disposable income. And disposable income is income that a household or a, uh, an individual have um, where he or she can either spend it or save it. So we call it disposable because um, it's, it's after uh, bills, taxes, all this. So you can either spend money or you can save money, right? And the rate at which you spend or the rate at which you save has an important effect on the economy. That is to say, if you consume more, so spending would be what we call C, or consumption. If, you're, if you consume more, if a household consumes more, then the rate at which the economy grows will become faster. If a household or business, or a household or a, sorry, a household or a person saves more, then the rate at which um, the economy grows becomes smaller. It's called the multiplier effect. The multiplier effect um, uses a couple different things. We have a propensity to consume. In fact, we have an average propensity to consume, and what this means is this with the average dollar, how much do we get? How much do we spend, and how much do we consume? And our simple uh, formula would be um, APC, the average propensity to consume, would just be C, or consumption over DI, which is direct uh, disposable income. Same thing with ABS. The average propensity to save would just be savings over DI. So however much you give one dollar, how much do you save? How much do you um, of the disposable income? And that would be your average propensity to consume. And what that tells economists is for all the dollars we have, how much do we save? How much do we consume? And then there's an even more important um, factor we look at, and that's the marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to save. That means with every additional dollar we get, marginal means an additional, with every additional dollar that we get, how much do we consume, how much do we save? So the formula for this is a little bit different. That is, uh, for MPC or the marginal propensity to consume, uh, it's a change in consumption over the change in DI. So, how, so when we get an extra dollar, that difference between the first dollar and the next dollar, how much of that new dollar do we consume versus how much more um, income we're bringing in? And the same thing for NPS, a change in savings from one to the next over a change in DI, right? That is the marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to save. And with that, we can come up with multipliers which give us an idea of when an additional dollar is put into our gross domestic product, how much is it, sorry, I should say, when an additional dollar is spent, how much of that is added to the gross domestic product, the GDP. Uh, we have a, you should have a video already of GDP, of nominal and real. So for instance, if I go and I spend, um, if I go and Let's say these markers are each a dollar, and let's say there's five markers, so five dollars. If I have this five dollars and I go and spend it somewhere, that doesn't mean that five dollars is added to the GDP. In fact, it means more is going to be added. Because at the business that I went to, they're going to hold on to part of it as their wages, paying their employees, and part of that they will spend and the employees will take their wages and spend it somewhere and that company will pay their employees with wages and they will spend that money and it multiplies. We call it the multiplier effect. So we use multipliers from uh, in uh, fiscal policy by looking at our marginal propensity to save and our marginal propensity to consume. Consume and save. All right? In fact, we have formulas. The government the government and investment multiplier 
is 1 over 1 minus multiple prints that it can assume, or 1 over MPS, because MPC plus MPS must equal 1. Okay? So, for instance, if our, um, let's say MPC equal 0.75, and let's, that would mean that MPS would have to equal 0.25 because the two have to equal 1. So, if our MPC was 0.75, that would be 1 over 1 minus 0.75, which would be 1 over 0.25, right? And that's the same thing as 1 over MPX. That would mean that our multiplier would be 4, which means that for every one more dollar that is spent um, by the government or through investment, it increases our GDP four times. So, for instance, if we spend $100 in government spending, and that's not all government spending, it's not social security spending, it's nothing like that, it's direct government spending, building roads, building bridges, an aircraft carrier, whatever, if we spend $100 on that, our multiplier is 4, that means that $400 has been added to the GDP. So what we're going to get into is the government, if we want to make up a lapse in a recession, use fiscal policy, the government doesn't have to spend the whole uh, gap in um, full employment production. They just need to figure out what our multiplier is and how much we're in recession and, and, and come up with the difference. For tax multiplier, it's a little bit different. Um, if you get a break in taxes, if our taxes are reduced, let's say our taxes are reduced by $100, and we're probably going to spend a lot of it, but we're not going to spend all $100. In fact, we're going to save some of it. So let's say we save you know, 20%. That means we only have $80 that we put into the economy. So the multiplier of a tax break is different. Direct government and direct investment has a much higher rate of, uh, or uh, a, actually, a, 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 multiplier effect of one more than a tax multiplier. Tax multiplier is negative NPC over NPS. So in this case, it would be negative 0.75 over 0.25, which would equal negative 3. So if we wanted to have our um, economy go up by $400, and we had a multiplier here of negative 3, we would actually need to have a much higher uh, we would have to have a tax break of $133, right? So it'd be, if we wanted to go up by 400, 400 divided by 3 is 133.3. So we would have to cut taxes by $133.33 if we wanted to have a $400 increase in GDP. Because when you cut taxes, some people are going to keep some of that money in savings and not spend it. Whereas in government or investment, the money is spent directly. In fact, if you cut taxes, let's say you cut, let's say you increase government spending by hundred dollars, right? Or you cut taxes by hundred dollars. I'll say this. Let's say, I'm sorry, let's say we increase government spending by hundred dollars and we increase taxes by hundred dollars. We will still have an increase in GDP because of the, uh, of the multiplier effect, right? It's called a balanced budget multiplier. The budget is balanced, we spend an extra hundred dollars, we tax an extra hundred dollars, but in the end, if our multiplier for the government is four, that gives us four hundred dollars. Our multiplier for the taxes is three, that gives us three hundred dollars. So our GDP is actually going up by a hundred dollars and we've had a balanced budget. Now there are other problems that will be associated with doing this, but um, um, for this case, this is it. So. You should know the APC and APS, MPC, MPS, the government and tax multipliers, and what disposable income is. And since we have a little bit more time on this graph, I want to talk about the Keynesian expenditures model. All right? What this is, this model was developed by John Maynard Keynes, and it doesn't involve prices. On the x-axis, you have real GDP, and some textbooks will say national income or net income. And on the Y, you have aggregate expenditures, the expenditures of the entire nation, the entire economy. And so the first thing you need to do after you draw your axis is draw a 45 degree line, okay? And this 45 degree line represents where expenditures hits GDP. And this vertical line here is our output 
It is our GDP output at full employment. And you remember that full employment output doesn't mean that every single person is working. It means that every single person is working minus frictional and structural unemployment. So at this point right here, if our aggregate expenditures meets right here, and this is essentially GDP, so consumer plus investment plus government plus net exports. If it meets right here, then we're at full employment output, okay? And that's good, that's where we wanna be. If we are, if our expenditures model hits the 45 degree line after full employment, so if it hits this line after full employment, what we've created is we actually have, this is the output we want to have, and here is our output. The difference is an inflationary gap. We're making more. We're going into an inflationary gap. Now, this model doesn't have prices, but we'll see that later show up on the ADAS graph, the aggregate demand aggregate expenditures graph. If, for instance, our model hits, I don't know if you can see this, if it hits the 45 degree line before it gets to full employment, what you've seen is a recessionary gap, where we're not making as many goods. We hit the 45 degree line before full employment. So our equilibrium would be, have us in recession. And so what you do is, you can, if we can know how much we're in recession, or how much we're in inflation, if we know those numbers specifically, and we're given our um, uh, consumption and savings where we can figure out our multipliers, then all we need to do is simply, if we know that there's a $500 billion gap in um, between our current equilibrium output and our full employment equilibrium output, if we know this is a $500 billion gap and we know we have a government multiplier of four, if we want, we can simply increase government spending by $125 billion, which is 500 divided by 4, and that should close the gap. Or what we can do, if we have a tax multiplier of 3, we can divide 500 by 3, which gives us 166.67, I think, um, and we can decrease taxes. Obviously, if you want to increase the uh, GDP, you decrease taxes, put more money in people's hands, and they will consume. So, um, those are what we can use our multipliers for, and we need the Keynes graph for this. Now, you're not going to see the Keynes graph a lot on the AP exam, but you will see questions regarding the expenditures model. And it's important to know uh, the 45 degree line is where these two axes hit, and it's where full employment hits the 45 degree line is our full employment equilibrium output. Anything that hits the 45 before that, means we're in recession. Anything that hits the 45 degree line after the full employment equilibrium output, then that means we're in an inflationary gap. And you can use the multipliers as a way to either close the gap or um, of recession or bring our economy down um, from an inflationary period.